Hello, I'm Justin Davis. I'm a Warport Clinical Lecturer at uh, Imperial College London. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the first of three MRCP Part 2 cardiology videos done on behalf of Past Test. This first video, we're looking at rhythms and pacing. So question one, a 78-year-old man has just driven his wife to hospital for a blood test when he suddenly collapses to the ground. There was no chest pain. On questioning, he gives a history of previous collapses in the last five years with no predisposing factors. He's on no medication and his blood pressure is 170 over 60 millimetres of mercury. An ECG is performed in A&E, is shown. You are asked to see him and advise. Which one of the following is the best management plan? I'll just give you a few seconds to consider your options. If you chose option B, admit for observation and plan for implantation of a permanent pacemaker, you're correct. Let's just take a moment to look at the electrocardiogram we had in the last question. You'll see this is fairly typical for someone with complete heart block a slow, regular ventricular escape rhythm with P wave activity noticeable, but there's no association between the P wave and the QRS complex. So you have mechanical and electrical dissociation. Heart block, of course, can be divided into three broad categories. First degree block, secondary degree block, and complete heart block. Let's just take a moment to look at each of these in turn. On the screen here, you see first degree heart block. You'll see that there's a P wave followed by a QRS complex on each beat. This is regular and repeating throughout the whole of this rhythm strip. What determines this to be first degree heart block is the time interval between the P wave and the QRS complex. Here you can see it, it exceeds five small squares or 200 milliseconds. When you get this, this is characteristic and, and indeed defines first degree block. Second degree block uh, can be split into two types. Type 1 is Venkiback, and there's a type 2. Type 1, Venkiback, you have an ever increasing length of the PR interval. If you look at the middle of this recording, you can see initially the PR interval is short, and then beat after beat after beat, it gets progressively longer until you see the point whereby it gets so long the conduction from the P wave to the next QRS complex gets dropped and you have a non-conducted ventricular beat. So this is typical of type 1 or Venkiback block. Type 2, however, is where you have an alternating pattern of a conducted beat with a non-conducted beat. So you see on the screen here, have a P wave followed by a QRS complex, then you just see a P wave with no QRS complex, and then the next beat is a P wave with a QRS complex. And this is a repeating pattern you see throughout this whole trace. And finally, we have third degree block, which of course was the nature of this question. Well, once again, you see here a long, regular time interval between each of the ventricular complexes, and indeed you see P waves, which in some circumstances appears to be fixed, but you can see on other beats there's no relationship whatsoever between the P wave and the QRS complex. So there's, there's an electrical and mechanical dissociation here. So what about managing uh, patients with uh, complete heart block? Well, one of the first things, and it's absolutely essential to do this, is to ensure there's no underlying cause. And the reason I say this is it's very easy to jump in, start putting a pacing wire into someone, for instance, when there's a potentially reversible cause which can prevent you having to do that. And one of the most frequent causes of this, of course, is having profound electrolyte disturbance which very simply may be having a potassium which is very, very high or a potassium which is very, very low. You'll frequently see if you correct that potassium, the patient goes from complete heart block back into sinus rhythm. And of course that avoids the need for you positioning pacing wires. Another cause may be having ischemic heart disease. So there may be underlying ischemia. Could affect any of the arteries, but probably it's most common in the right coronary arteries. This supplies the territory which determines the rhythm generation systems in the heart. And the third cause which we see frequently is, of course, drugs which slow the heart rate, and anyone who has a slight predisposition to bradycardia is most likely to then develop block. And these may be patients having beta blockers or calcium channel antagonists such as diltiazem. So once we've ensured there's no underlying cause, do we go ahead and pace immediately? 
Well, as I've said before, we want to make sure there's no potentially irreversible cause. And if there is, you want to go ahead and treat that, even if that means delaying implantation of a pacemaker or implantation of a permanent, uh, a temporary wire. We want to base our decision of when to go ahead uh, to some extent on if there's any hemodynamic compromise. So the patient in our last case had a systolic blood pressure of 170, so clearly there we have time. However, if that same patient came in with a blood pressure of 60 systolic, you wouldn't have time and then you would need to go ahead and implant a temporary wire to ensure that you had adequate cardiac output to prevent uh, complications of shock. And of course, the last indication here on our list, whether we go ahead and pace immediately, is, to t is if there is an, an indication for any specialist type of pacemaker. What do I mean by that? Well, if a patient comes in and they're known to have uh, con congestive cardiac failure and they also have heart block, we may not rush ahead and go and put a, a single chamber or dual chamber pacemaker in that person. We may opt to put a biventricular system in, which of course would give them more symptomatic benefit. So what are the different types of pacemakers? This is a question which is uh, frequently asked. So there are four broad categories of, of pacemakers, all essentially derived from a very, very similar mechanism or similar, similar structure of the box itself. The first is a, a single chamber device, which you can see on your screen here. And this is where we have a, a device usually mounted just below the clavicle on the left side of the chest with a wire which runs either through the cephalic vein or directly into the subclavian vein all the way down the superior vena cava and sits in the right ventricle. The typical patient who would get this kind of pacemaker is someone in atrial fibrillation who wouldn't benefit from atrial pacing or a very elderly patient uh, in whom... Uh, Again, their exercise capacity is going to be limited and they wouldn't benefit from the physiological benefits of having synchronicity between the atrium and the ventricle. The benefits of this kind of pacemaker is it's very simple to put in as there's only a single lead. It's also slightly cheaper. Dual chamber systems, which you can see implanted on the screen here, are very recognisable. Instead of a single lead into the right ventricle, you see there's a lead in the right ventricle and there's also a lead in the right atrium. In this case, the pacing box is sighted below the right clavicle. This is most likely due to the fact that this patient is left-handed. We implant these wherever possible if someone has an underlying uh, rhythm where the atrium and the ventricle are both contracting. So, for instance, first or second degree heart block. The reason for doing that is it's physiologically superior because we have the atrium contracting first and then the ventricle. By making small adjustments in the timing between when the atrium and ventricle contract, we can alter the amount of filling to the ventricle and thus increase the cardiac output. When these pacemakers were introduced, it was a huge advance, and uh, patients who have these uh, pacemakers implanted instead of single chamber pacemakers often describe marked uh, reduction in symptoms of breathlessness, which can often accompany a, sim a single chamber ventricular uh, pacing lead only. The third pacemaker which uh, we implant for more specialist indications are biventricular pacemakers. You can see this uh, illustrated on the screen in front of you now. You'll note the same two leads we had before, so there's a right ventricular and right atrial pacing lead. But in addition to this, there is a third lead, and this goes through the coronary sinus down one of the epicardial coronary veins. The purpose of this is to pace the left side of the heart. We do this because in patients with severe heart failure, they lose the synchronicity, so the chambers, the right and left ventricles, fail to contract in a synchronised manner. And as a result, the cardiac output falls. By pacing from the right ventricular apex and the left ventricular apex simultaneously, we can restore this synchronicity and increase our cardiac output. The final pacemaker I'm going to speak about is an internal cardiac defibrillator. This pacemaker acts much in the same way as external cardioversion by delivering a shock to the heart, but it has the benefits of being implanted in the patient and monitoring the rhythm 24 hours a day. In addition to being able to shock ventricular fibrillation, it can also monitor for rhythms such as ventricular tachycardia and has the advantage of being able to deliver both a large DC shock, such as would be delivered from external pads, or by anti-tachy pacing, this is a process whereby the ventricle paces faster than the underlying ventricular tachycardia rhythm, thereby in taking over the electrical conduction of that, the heart, and then all of a sudden stops. When it stops, it hopes to get a capture beat and restore the heart back to normal sinus rhythm. 
So let's have a look at question two. Uh, this is a 75 year old gentleman who complains of breathlessness on exertion. An ECG is performed in A&E. Which one of the following is the most significant observation on his electrocardiogram? If you chose E, atrial and ventricular pacing, you were correct. Let's take a moment to look at this electrocardiogram. You can see on this electrocardiogram both evidence of atrial pacing spikes, most noticeable in lead V2 and labelled with the red arrow here, and ventricular pacing spikes here in lead V3. What's noticeable if you look at the rhythm strip along the bottom is not all of the atrial beats, P waves, appear to be preceded by atrial pacing spikes. So it seems in this case that the pacemaker has the ability to be able to pace or not pace dependent on whether it detects an intrinsic beat. And indeed this is precisely what the programming of this pacemaker is. Now we know how a pacemaker is programmed by the nomenclature which uh, you'll often see recorded or documented in the notes. And I'm just going to spend a moment going through this because this often confuses candidates and sometimes comes up as a question. So let's start by the very simplest kind of pacemaker programmer, a VVI pacemaker. Well, what do these letters mean? And what, how does the position of them in, in this uh, structure determine uh, what the various function of these uh, pacemakers are? So the first letter here is V, and this refers to which chambers are paced. As this is a single chamber pacemaker we're talking about, it's pacing the ventricle. The next letter here, the one in the middle, refers to what's happening in terms of sensing, and it's sensing here the ventricular lead only. The I at the end it refers to its response. So this pacemaker has the ability to inhibit pacing. So if it determines a normal conducted ventricular beat, so it sees the QRS complex, it then says, hang on, I don't need to pace here and it then waits a period of time when it expects the next beat to come. So thereby, it facilitates intrinsic conduction wherever possible. And of course, this is beneficial for cardiac output. So let's just summarize that once again. A VBI pacemaker paces the ventricle, senses the ventricle, and the ventricular lead can be inhibited by intrinsic electrical activity. So what about a DDD pacemaker or another pacemaker you'd, you'd frequently see written in the notes. Well, this paces both chambers, so it can pace both the atrium and the right ventricle. It senses both chambers, so it can sense both the right ventricle and the right atrium. And it has inhibitory function of both of those chambers as well. So if it detects intrinsic atrial activity, it doesn't pace the atrium. If it detects intrinsic ventricular uh, activity, it doesn't pace the ventricle thereby once again facilitating normal electrical conduction. So let's move on to question three. Which one of the following is true? Current DVLA guidelines state that. I'll give you a moment to consider your options. If you chose answer A, following acute ST elevation myocardial infarction, a patient must refrain from driving for four weeks, you were correct. So let's have a look at the driving regulations. So with an acute ST elevation myocardial infarction, the DVLA states that the patient must refrain from driving for four weeks. The same regulation of four weeks away from driving is also there and enforced for an troponin positive cardiac event. However, if the troponin is not elevated, the patient can drive at discharge from hospital. What about an unexplained loss of consciousness? Well, unexplained loss of consciousness, the patient must not drive for six months. Pacemaker insertion, this would be one week, which is similar to that of an angioplasty or a stent being inserted, which again is of one week. The DVLA guidelines, of course, don't just cover cardiology and uh, indeed patients have transient ischemic attacks they should be off driving for four weeks and epilepsy if certainly the first seizure they need to be off driving for a whole year in total. So let's move on to question four. A 55 year old female presents with history of tiredness and decreased effort tolerance of three months duration. 
shows a five-year history of hypertension controlled on indapamide slow release 1.5 milligrams per day. She's a lifelong non-smoker, has no family history of premature coronary artery disease. Her lipid profile checked six months earlier was normal. She has no other past medical history of note. Physical examination reveals an irregular pulse of rate 95 beats per minute with a blood pressure of 135 over 80 millimeters of mercury. No jugular venous distension was noted and apex beat in the fifth intercostal space was palpated. Her normal heart sounds were detected without the presence of any murmur. These are results of some uh, haematology and biochemical investigations. She underwent an electrocardiogram which demonstrated atrial fibrillation with a ventricular rate of 108 beats per minute. An echocardiogram was performed which demonstrated a left ventricular ejection fraction of 58% and left atrial diameter of 4.6 centimeters, concentric left ventricular hypertrophy and trivial mitral regurgitation. She started on low molecular heparin. Which of the following treatments would you institute next? I'll give you a moment to consider your options. If you chose warfarin, that's answer E, you were correct. So let's have a look at the different management strategies in atrial fibrillation, particularly with regards to rate versus rhythm control. Most of the symptoms in atrial fibrillation are governed by the ventricular response. What do I mean by that? Well, how fast or how slow someone's heart rate is both at rest and during exertion. You may take two different types of patients. One who has a low resting heart rate, even if they're in atrial fibrillation, who then when they exercise, get very, very few symptoms. The heart rate doesn't rise very much. A second may have a higher resting atrial fibrillation rate, who then when they exercise, have far greater problems as the heart rate rises very, very fast. Now, most of the symptoms occur as a result of breathlessness, some as a result of chest pain, and some as a result of patients just complaining of palpitations themselves. Now, generally speaking, the current guidelines tell us that in younger subjects, it's best to aim to try and restore them to sinus rhythm, whereas in elderly subjects, there's certainly little outcome bef between keeping them in atrial fibrillation with a good rate control or restoring them to sinus rhythm themselves. Let's have a look at the drug therapeutic options we have in atrial fibrillation. So by far and the best, the best drugs to control heart rate in atrial fibrillation will be beta blockers. After that, we have calcium channel antagonists such as diltiazem. The second line agents, which of course are still commonly prescribed but aren't primary drugs in the NICE criteria, will be drugs such as digoxin. Now, these drugs are all very, very effective at controlling heart rate, but will do little to convert people back into sinus rhythm. Drugs which we would frequently use to convert people from atrial fibrillation to sinus rhythm would include amiodarone and flecainide. And of course, we prescribe these both acutely for patients who have hypotension in hospital, and of course, with appropriate anticoagulation cover for patients as outpatients as well. Often the, the choice of drug therapy is superseded by DC cardioversion. This is often a very simple route and very, very successful in restoring sinus rhythm to patients who have an underlying atrial uh, irregularity. The third option is atrial fibrillation ablation. This is an electrophysiological technique where catheters are passed through the veins in the leg up to the heart and ablation is performed. This can be very, very successful in patients, although frequently requires repeat procedures. So let's have a look at some anticoagulation issues with regards to atrial fibrillation. If you have a look at the slide you can see on your screen here, you see on the top the left atrium, the mitral valve, and then moving down to the left ventricle. Now, of course, normally what happens is the left atrium contracts, and as it contracts, it ejects blood through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. But in subjects with atrial fibrillation, the atrium is not contracting, but is fibrillating away. This chaotic fibrillating activity doesn't lead to atrial contraction, and as a result, clot can form in the left atrium and the left atrial appendage. So if we want to try and restore sinus rhythm in these patients, we need to ensure adequate anticoagulation for, with an INR of more than two for a four-week period prior to attempted cardioversion. Or we need to ensure that the patient is adequately anticoagulated and then perform a transesophageal echocardiogram to demonstrate there's no thrombus in the left atrium 
or left atrial appendage. If you look at this slide here, you can see where the arrow is pointing, there's a big thrombus in the left atrial appendage. Now, I'd be very concerned in this patient, if you were to cardiovert them, that this thrombus would move from the left atrial appendage through the mitral valve into the left ventricle and then up into the head and give them a big stroke. So here, clearly, this would be contraindicated and you'd want to ensure an adequate period of anticoagulation prior to offering uh, DC cardioversion. The CHADS-2 score has been developed to assess who is at high risk of thromboembolus. This is a simple scoring system where one point is attributed to each risk factor. The points are then added up and the risk calculated and the treatment algorithm is determined. Let's have a look at this. Well, here's the, mnem the mnemonic on the screen, CHADS2. The first letter refers to congestive heart failure. If you have that, you get one point. The next is hypertension. If you have that, you get another point, and so on. If your age is more than 75, if you're diabetic, or if you've had a stroke. We add all the points up from the score, and we get a risk prediction of stroke as follows. If you have zero points, your risk is below 2% of annual risk of stroke. And you can see this rises markedly to over 18% if you have six points on the CHADS2 score. Now very simply, if you have a CHADS score of zero, you need to use aspirin only in your prescribing. If you have a CHADS2 score of one, you have a choice of either aspirin or warfarin. And if you have a CHADS score of more than one, the guidelines recommend warfarin therapy. Now, in addition to this score, what may sway you with a CHADS2 score of 1, where you're wondering, well, should it be aspirin or warfarin, is particularly if the patient has a big dilated left atrium. If they do, you know that these patients are most likely to develop a clot in there and more predisposed to this clot than embolizing out. So in this group of patients, I would be happier with them on warfarin rather than aspirin therapy. Of course, the CHADS2 score is a guideline for us and it can help dictate which is the best therapy in terms of prevention of uh, thromboembolic disease. However, this of course needs to be taken in its clinical context. You need to of course determine whether the patient has any potential bleeding risks, perhaps from a stomach ulcer or a tumour. And of course you need to take on board compliance. Some patients are very, very uh, happy with attending a weekly assessment of their INR, whereas others are not at all happy and would prefer to take the risk of stroke. And of course, this may push you one way or the other in going towards aspirin therapy or warfarin therapy. On the horizon are new therapies such as dabigatran uh, and studies such as the Recover study, which provides new impetus in providing new uh, drugs and new pharmacological regimes which provide similar levels of anticoagulation to warfarin but don't require the weekly or monthly uh, therapeutic monitoring such as warfarin does at the moment. The one problem with these new therapies, as they are at the moment, is they're approximately 10 times as expensive as warfarin therapy, and this, of course, limits their widespread adoption into the NHS. So that concludes the first of the three MRCP Part 2 cardiology lectures. I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. Uh, I'd recommend that you look through it once again, practice the questions, and then prepare yourself for the second and third parts of this lecture series. Mm -hmm.